Grid Kids. Hey everybody, welcome to Grid Kids. I'm your host, Nicholas Semrod, and this is the very first episode of Grid Kids. This is going to be a podcast about the music business experience as a whole, and I'll be interviewing musicians, managers, gear creators, and gearheads, educators, and writers in an attempt to both entertain and educate. Oftentimes, we only get to see the end product with all of these folks, and I feel that by hearing their stories, their advice, and their ideas of success and failure, that we can demystify the path a bit and hopefully take something from their words for ourselves, either as advice or as entertainment. Due to the fact that this is my first foray into podcasting, I want to take this time to ask for your patience with me while I fine-tune my approach to this podcast. There will no doubt be, as there's already been, some wrinkles that will hopefully be ironed out with experience, friendly advice, and hopefully soon, a budget. Speaking of budget, and I'll keep this part short, In the next month or two, I will be creating a funding account, most likely through Patreon, with the intention of increasing the quality of this podcast. Eventually, I want to be able to bring in guests from a distance and to be able to provide high-quality video versions of these interviews and to be able to rent studio space while doing some of these interviews on the road during my touring seasons. So please bear with me, throw me gentle advice when you can, and most importantly, have a good time and thank you for joining me on this journey. My very first pair of guests are the lovely and beautiful Miss Genevieve Artadi and Isis Giraldo, aka Chiquita Magic. You all know Genevieve as one half of the legendary synth-pop band Knower, and also from her solo work. Isis is an incredible keyboard player and lo-fi artist based in Montreal, and these two are currently on a West Coast tour together. We recorded this live the day before they embarked on this tour, and we did the interview in an unisolated space. So, do your best to either ignore or enjoy the occasional motorcycle driving past or roommate dishwashing party. Without further ado, here is Genevieve Artadi and Isis Geraldo. I am here. With Genevieve Artadi and Isis Geraldo, who I'm totally pronouncing your last name wrong, but you said You're killing it, brah. So I'm going to let it go. Um, Also known as Chiquita Magic. Hi, guys. Hello. We've been hanging out all day, so like I'm just going to pretend like I'm uh, reintroducing everyone and like I just got here. Like I haven't been talking to you for four hours all day. So far, um, you guys are about to go on tour together. Yep. (laughs) She looks fucking scared. No, I'm not <laughs> scared. Because you're taking me. <laughs> Are you, you guys have done, have you done the duo thing on a tour, just you guys? I know you hang out and tour with Lewis doing small We've things. done a couple of gigs together, a duo. Yeah. Two, oh, actually. Was straight up. Was it two? LA, right? I think it's been two. One well, in New York, one in LA. What was the LA one? Uh, with Pedro. Well, there was a band. Oh yeah, that's true. No, so, <laughs> what are you guys doing <laughs> instrument-wise? Are you? I know you're playing keys, and you're probably doing key bass and keys, which we're going to talk about in a minute, because you're a superhuman. <laughs> yep. Just mostly key bass and singing. Okay. And a little bit. Of and then are you playing? I'm going to play some some MIDI keyboard. MIDI keyboard? Yeah, with GarageBand tracks. Some medieval keyboard? Medieval. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, ye, ye and then you said old you're, keyboard. you're singing on everything too, right? Yeah. Have you guys been rehearsing all week for this? Yes. Yeah. How is it going? <laughs> Mostly oh drunken. my god. <laughs> 3 a.m. <laughs> drunkies. Well, I think that isn't the term that you're, the, the, the advice is that you're supposed to practice how you plan on performing. <laughs> that's exactly. exactly. See, that's, said. I think that's the hang. I think more people should probably, <laughs> I have this whole range of students who probably like wakes up and drinks coffee and is in this super productive mindset and you practice the whole time while you're in that mindset and then you get to these shows and you're just done <laughs> yeah. like you should practice when you're done so you know how you're gonna be so what i'm saying so is students true. just wake up and get loaded right away no, yeah. I mean, <laughs> kind of like what we did today <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think that's that's a good part i, ha- I have to bring up uh you see, so i have to bring up your key base abilities <laughs> oh my god i know no we're going there um so when I first met you, 
was on the Lewis Cole shows down in Mexico City, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. And so we went down there, and I had heard that you played keyboards <laughs> uh, because Lewis was like, dude, she's dope. And, you know, anyone thinks that Lewis thinks is dope, I usually trust him. But you don't Aww. get the full scope. So I was like, okay, she's probably cool. She probably knows a few lines. <laughs> and then maybe five months after that, we went to... Where I was in Montreal, Montreal. Yeah. yeah, for Montreal Jazz Fest, mm-hmm. and I was playing with Corey Henry's group, mm-hmm. and we went to Le Cipher, mm-hmm. or no, it was Community <laughs> After Hours or some shit. Oh, it was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and we went in, and I knew you were playing, so I was like, "Screw it, I'll go check it out. It's gonna be fun." It was also right beside where you were playing. Get to see the homie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was easy to go to, which always <laughs> helps when you're on tour. Um, but so we walk in there, and I'm with this camp of people that is just insanely part like partying insanely hard and i'm not gonna say which ones were partying insanely <laughs> hard but i was there with some of Corey's band with like tehran and Corey and the girls and then thundercat was there and uh <laughs> justin brown was there as well so we're all at the bar and everyone's getting all lit up it was great <laughs> and out of nowhere the band starts playing and we hear I think the best way I can describe it is it, it sounded like a DJ was just picking parts of different samples. Whoa. And it was killing. It, it wasn't like we, it was like we were taking all the, we were hearing all these samples that were like all these really jazz chords in orders that I wouldn't have ever played them. <laughs> and so literally like throughout the next 10, 15 minutes, Thundercat and Justin Brown and I start kind of going like, man, either somebody's killing and just, and just playing some really out stuff that like happens to be working extremely well, or there's a DJ up there just pushing <laughs> random buttons. And we debate, we were debating about it because we couldn't see the stage. Like I just saw hella people on stage, all these keyboards, and yeah. like out of nowhere, we finally start creeping towards the front, and I notice like, damn, Isis is playing all that shit. I guess we can we can cuss on my podcast apparently. Um, fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. Um, so. We got up and like all of us were just floored because you're up there not only playing key bass but also just like me, <laughs> like all these weird changes. Weird. And it was so killing because that was my first experience hearing you play. So, aw, fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, and it was that was such a cool. That event reminded me of the group, the group slash event I used to do in New York called the Lessons. So much it was mm-hmm. like an open jam session. Yeah, you're just jamming, just yeah. like improvising. But it's but it's improvising with a spirit of love, which sound it sounds corny and cliche a little bit, but like in New York, mm-hmm. there's all these jam sessions that are so head cutty and broy. Yeah, and you know, an ego spirit of fear. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. It's this like, let me get up and prove that that last guy was terrible. Mm-hmm. And at least in the lesson, and I, I felt like this probably is the same thing for the cipher. Was you had this vibe of like, okay, anyone that sits in, like we're we're part of a family. Like if someone's struggling, we're going to do whatever we can to either lift them up mm-hmm. or to like find a way to educate them in a nice manner. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we used to tell people at the lesson to you know, come here and learn how to hang. Like, don't come here expecting to play right away. It's mm-hmm. not about that. You have to expect to, like, be a part of the family, be a part of the vibe. Mm-hmm. Once you have that, then you're going to know where we're trying to come from and sitting in won't be as crazy. So mm-hmm. that event, I, I will always remember that. That was a super killing experience. Aw. Yeah. Dude. Yeah, I love I loved that shit because I feel like before... I started playing with community. I like didn't really know. I didn't. I just had never done that kind of thing before. And yeah. for this gig, it was kind of like we're just gonna fucking play for three hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's gonna be like a party, mm-hmm. and we're just gonna like <clears throat> not know what's happening. And the whole I the whole idea for me, I was just like, let's just fucking do like a rave vibe mm-hmm. where everyone can just come here and just like dance mm-hmm. and disconnect. And like at raves, like the DJ never really stops. Like there's always a fucking four on the floor. There's always like a beat that keeps going. It's yep. not just like, okay, the song's over. Like, you know, cause that like ruins the vibe a lot of yeah, the time. Yeah, there's no, it's like emotionally, it's like, no, we're giving you a basis for the night. Yeah, it's more just like the, we're, we're trying to set a vibe. Mm-hmm. And like, it's not about our ego and it's not about like, how good we are whatever how much we can shred and shit because i don't really even feel like i can shred at all you know i'm just trying to like listen sure. and like just listen pretty mm-hmm. much i feel like if you listen music just tells you what to do you know yeah and it's 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 a it's a weird thing to 
that I've noticed with a lot of the, I'm, I'm going to sound like such an old musician here, but I've noticed with a lot of the young scene is that they don't try and it's, it's more about me, you mm. know, and it stays there. Like, I feel like most kids are always that way. I mean, I know when I was 18, I was trying to be a shredder, but like you get to like 21, 22 and some of the old cats go like, nah, uh-uh. mm-hmm. but now it's encouraged. Now you have Instagram and, and mm-hmm. the, the, I won't say what I was going to call it, but <laughs> it's, it's it ends up being a, a scene that's very, you know, focused on the attention I get, you know. Or like on the ability or something. Yeah, and it's, and it's on a very specific ability. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily totally. groove or dynamics or emotion. It's like, nah, notes or something like that. But um, I, I run into that too. I've done probably two or three house parties, Genevieve, at your house. Oh my God, the best. And I get the same vibe here. Like, it's, it's a weird scenario, but it's like, the things I've done here, I think I did a sh- set with Lewis here, yeah. and then I had a, a really ill-fated gig with Zach Danziger that I think I ended up just playing the quarter inch on, because my gear was all messed up. Um, here? Yeah, it was Zach and Owen Biddle and I. Oh yeah, I remember that! And, that was awesome. And I, my power cord messed up to the profit or something, so I borrowed... <laughs> So I borrowed one of Lewis's like Casios, and then the battery went out at the first song. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had so I had my pedals, and we were just plugging into. Uh, I just had my quarter inch running through hella pedals, and was like trying. To <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's fine. No one did, I'm, awesome. which I'm really happy about. But I run into that same vibe here. It's like your guys' house parties. There's none, at least that I've noticed, of that like kind of jerky musician. Like, what do you have? Mm-hmm. What do you have? It's like everyone here loves each other. Yeah. Which is real it's weird. Like, is that mm-hmm. an LA thing or is it a you guys thing? <laughs> Dude. I think maybe a little both. Yeah. You could find you could find jerks anywhere. <laughs> sure. <laughs> what did you notice cuz you grew up in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Did you have you noticed that the community's always been strong here or were there like phases where you felt like you kind of had to like build it up or or try try new stuff to keep it energized? I think it's stronger now. Yeah. Than it ever was before. What do you notice different about it? Um, maybe it was always strong, but at least like I, per- I personally just know more people from like different parts of my life, and now I feel like they all know each other. Sure. And I feel a big supportive vibe kind of across everyone. Maybe that sounds so hippie, but I actually think it's true. Well, you, I think you guys give that vibe off to you. I think bands mm-hmm. tend to get what they put out there. Totally. I, don't, I can think of numerous bands that the members of those bands have very aggressive personalities. And even if they're making great music, it's like, that's the thing you're going to get. Like, those are the fans you're going to get. You're going to get fans who are like, oh, that's cool, but check me out. Mm, you know, yeah. And your fans are like, man, those guys are awesome. I do something too, um, but go see them first. You know, like, it's very yeah. selfless, which is really dope. Mm. Um, yeah, your hang is also very positive, which was strange for me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I being in being in Brooklyn six years, I think you you learn to thrive on cynicism, mm. and it took me it took me a minute here to get used to like oh everyone cares about each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a, a maybe I've told you this story, but this actually this happened down in Mexico City where. You might have been involved in this story, maybe not. Um, but I was talking to Sam Gandell and someone else was in the room, maybe you, maybe somebody else, and we were talking about like voodoo, like D'Angelo's voodoo record, I think. I could be totally wrong on this, but the moral of the story is the same. And whoever was in the room is like, oh, I haven't heard that before. Mm. And every part of cynicism in me went, what the? <laughs> like, what do you mean you have I went right into like that kind of dickhead response. Before I had a second, before it even came out, Sam goes, oh, I'm so excited for you to have that experience. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. It fucked me up so hard. <laughs> like, it really, it, like, I, I think I started talking and then went, <laughs> That's awesome. And it just he totally like rocked my worldview <laughs> in like four seconds of like, oh, you can respond that way too. Mm-hmm. Word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it totally messed me up. Oh, I love Sam. I just remember Prince. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's still a life goal of mine is to convince Lewis Cole that, that Prince is funky. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> so I you still, fell out of your seat. Yeah. I, I even to this day, even to this day, I think about it and I'm just like, man, I don't know if I can game with that guy anymore. <laughs> you can. <laughs> I know I can and I will, and I will convince him to like Prince. So. <laughs> and that's the only reason I'm gonna get with yeah, him. No. <laughs> yeah. I think I found I found one tune. I found one tune that I played for him, and he was like, yeah. This is kind of cool. <laughs> I think that's a win. I think this is kind yeah, of cool. That's a win. Like, I like that one. It was yeah. like purple. Purple music. I think purple it's music. Called. It's two chords for fifteen minutes. I was into that that's very a, much. That's amazing. Oh, I was playing that for JD Beck, and he hit me up the next day. Like, bro, what the hell was that? It was amazing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, JD. it was crazy. Um, so you guys are doing the two-person tour this time, and you're doing a. It's like a week and a half or something like that, and then you go to Iceland, right? Well, yeah, week, we, we're only gone for a few days. I think it's right? like a week. Oh, yeah, it is a week. It looked like it was five or six shows. Yeah. One, yeah. Of, them, one of them is here in L.A., and I yep. didn't write down the date. February 5th. The 5th. 5th. And Boot it's at leg where? Theater. The bootleg on February 5th. Go see Genevieve and Isis slash Chiquita Magic Crush. Um, you guys were both on the big band tour in Europe. Oh, my friend. God, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I saw some videos. <laughs> give give me the rundown. Like the, the one thing I was gonna ask about it is I I haven't done a ton of L- Lewis and You slash Noah gigs, but that mu- music is insane. It is like it's, it's so fun. It's so the fact energetic. that Jacob Mann has it memorized to me is still just, I'm just amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm using He's sheet music so like an old man. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I know Dennis still uses sheet music. He does, so so he does. Word, word to the sheet music uh, old memory folks. But, uh, <laughs> how how did what were there issues with the preparation at all? Did you guys run into like arrangement deals? Like how did that work? Oh my God, no, it felt really easy. It was easy. Yeah. It felt super easy. Jesus, how? Because <laughs> they kill it, man. So they t- they just listened to the recordings and just charted everything out, like in. No, no, Lewis did everything. Wow. And then Joachim, the leader of the Norbotten big band in Sweden, helped mm-hmm. um, like fix things and and uh, and then we rehearsed for a few days in Sweden, mm-hmm. and then everybody just kind of like killed it. Mm-hmm. And Isis and I bounced around on stage. <laughs> Bounce. <laughs> and Isis cut her hand in one gig, Holy and I didn't sh- see it. She like sprayed all over the <laughs> the stage. I love that. And, and uh, she's like, hey, Jen, you want to see something gross? In mid-show. <laughs> mid-show. Yeah, mid-show. And I'm like, what is it? And she shows me your hand. I'm like, oh, my God, you need a Band-Aid. And uh, she was like, no, I'm fine. But I insisted, so we went and got a Band-Aid. There was literally blood, like bl- little puddles of blood, like all around me and like around the trombone <laughs> section. Because that was like the closest uh-huh. section to pants. me. And on my pants and on my <laughs> blouse. And I was wearing like a kind of like kill billish yeah. yellow thing. And it was just like perfect. It just made everything I feel like you come probably together. Had, you probably have people in the audience that thought that was part of the I think so. I think so. Because <laughs> that's what I, would think. I mean. I've seen like, like people giving birth to records and like all kinds of weird. <laughs> I've seen you guys do enough stuff. I, I don't think I've been involved with anything other than like a group dance on stage, but I've definitely seen some very strange things happen. So I'm sure that no one was surprised by this. <laughs> No, the, there was cool. the video of was it Rosanna Friedman, your oh tour manager, my God. dressed up as a tyrannosaurus? Oh yeah, she's done. She's been a, ty- a tyrannosaurus, and she's been the Grim Reaper. Oh uh, yeah, and that was a big band hang. Right? She's very versatile. <laughs> she's <laughs> tight. She, she, she fucking play, rocks it. She can play all roles, including bodyguard. <laughs> yes, tour bodyguard. Rosanna would, she would beat me in a fight pretty easily. She would beat all of us. Yeah. That's why we feel safe around her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she'd take all of us. Shout, shout out to Rosanna Freeman. <laughs> oh my God, that's so good. So you guys start in Portland, you end in Iceland, and then did I hear you saying that you're, are you currently booking something in South America, or are you? Yeah, we're, we're going to do some Noah shows and probably some solo things too. Nice. And Chiquita's going to play. Hell yeah. Her own stuff. Oh, it's like dual, it's like Noir slash Chiquita tour. Yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're aiming for. But, but, but yeah, yeah, there's a there's a big eclipse on the on July second, so we're gonna be there. We're gonna, we're kind of centering the whole tour around that. <laughs> that's so good. 
and uh, my birthday is July 1st, and there's also, uh, and we want to go, to, I've always wanted to go to Easter Island, so we're going to go there. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm an idiot. Remind me where Easter Island is. I think it's like bottom tip. It's like close to Chile. Like you can, I think you can take a boat from Santiago to okay. Easter Island. That's amazing. Bottom tip. Bottom tip. I've never. <laughs> Fucking geographer over here. <laughs> Jesus. I've never been to South America ever. I'm going, um, we're doing a Jakarta hit together, Genevieve, and oh, four yay. days later, four days later, I'm playing in Ecuador. Whoa, dude. Yeah. Trans- My body is uh, going to not be super into what I'm doing. Yeah, today. yeah. I'm going from Brazil to Jakarta. Oh, <laughs> what do we, why do we do this? Because <laughs> it's Cause fun. Because we hate ourselves. <laughs> <No. laughs> so give me, I, I've uh, been lucky enough to sleep here a few times and <laughs> hear your process but i am i'm obsessed with how you and lewis write um i noticed that you guys do a lot of like he'll he'll have a groove or something and then you guys loop it and just are like okay what about this melody yeah. what about this melody and you'll do that for <laughs> hours yeah we'll come up with like 40 or so melodies and do you do you have like a uh What's your selection process? You just both kind of figure out which one is... So we, okay, so we record them. A lot of times we'll do some at home, but a lot of times we'll do while we're driving. Like we, we went to Disneyland recently. Yeah. And he'll just shove a microphone in my face and I'll sing all different kinds of melodies. While and you're then, driving? Yeah, while I'm driving and miss the exits and everything. And then we listen back to all of them and we go, I like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, I like this. This would be good for a string line at the end. This doesn't sound like a chorus. So your guys is super, it's like very, very, very 50-50. Uh, that, that part of the process is I too. mean, he does the, the production yeah. hand, but yeah. like, that's so dope how you guys write. And it's also it's like, amazing. I feel like it's rare for two people, <laughs> this kind of ties into what we were talking about before the podcast, but... I think it's rare for two people just to get along for more than <laughs> like how long have you guys been playing it's been like uh, nine nine years i think nine years okay maybe ten because i was a super fan of both of you well before i met you in new york yeah you guys were doing hella covers and crazy stuff yeah and like new york that was the thing was like oh there's the scene of young weirdos in la and you guys were like <laughs> the king slash queen of young weirdos. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, part of riot why I moved out here because yeah. the young weirdo thing kind of disappeared in New York for me. Everyone got too serious. Oh. <laughs> Damn. It's tricky. New York's, New York's amazing. Um, would you ever live there? Have you thought about moving? I thought about it a long time ago, but I don't, I, I love LA so much. Mm-hmm. I love the sun, <clears throat> constant sun. Yeah. And I love having space from like i can be isolated and have the space to write and i like driving which is weird but i like it no it's not weird at all yeah it's just nice to be alone in the car and sing i'm telling you you are preaching right now because my new york experience and i feel like a lot of people's new york experience is very different most people love the subway because it's like oh it's a cheap way to like be loaded Mm -hmm. and get home (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> like the whole idea of being in a box with 300 other people and then no one's really talking to each other I mean people do there is a, a little. cool like connection there yeah and it depends on the hood too yeah mm-hmm. um, but you're right a lot of the time it's people just like being totally into this thing but yet you're still in each other's space yeah kind of vibes that's it's, its own bond in its own way it can be I mean I think it makes you notice it gives you a weird empathy yeah. Because you know that, like, okay, if I'm on this box with 300 other people, like, a lot of these people are having awful days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember when we went there and it was, like, angry city? Oh, yeah, it was, it it was, was a crazy so time. It was crazy, like, everybody we interacted with was angry. Was it beginning of summer? No, it was oh. winter. It was a few, a couple months ago, and it Whoa. was just, like, we were just, like, what is happening? Like, <laughs> yeah. why is everyone so upset? It's a very... I don't know. I, New York, New York's aggression to me is very, very good for certain people. Like, mm-hmm. I really liked being there because it it pushes you to really. It's it sucks to live there, so you have to try really hard at something. 
That's why every restaurant there is amazing. Every musician there is like usually pretty decent. Yeah. Um, You know, all the artists there are super top notch. Mm -hmm. But that thing is also, it's the the duality of like, yeah, it promotes great stuff, but all those great people end up being really dark. (laughs) Or a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe that's just my experience, but I've, I've definitely run into that. Mm-hmm. Even the New Yorkers that moved here, like we all kind of—that's where that cynicism comes from. It's like, damn, mm-hmm. I'm waking up and this place is brutal and hard to live in, and I have to try really hard. Mm-hmm. And there's a beauty in that. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also a beauty being away from that. So, yeah, you you guys definitely uh, opened my eyes being around that. Um, it was man, it was one of my goals to play with you guys when I moved here. <laughs> Aww. I was like, man, nah, I'm trying to get that nowhere again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just put out a record. Yeah. When it came out in November, right? Yeah, in November. And it's called Chiquita Magic. It's called It's Different. It's called It's Different. Yeah. So was there a self titled? There was a couple albums before, yeah. Oh, okay, work. Yeah. Awesome. And one of those, how many? It's like six, seven tunes, right? Yeah, it's seven or eight, I think. Okay. Something like that. It's really short. It's like yeah. 22 minutes or something. <laughs> and are you doing solo shows or anything to promote or are you just kind of in my boat of I like really, i dude. want something out <laughs> yeah i'm just i just like to release shit i don't know i'm kind of working on a couple albums now and maybe it'll come out on a label in japan and that uh, might be yeah. like that might be a thing yeah um so that would be cool because i kind of just have put a lot of my music out independently sure but yeah not really too many solo shows. I'm kind of just like focusing on new new stuff. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. What is, what is your... I, I noticed with, with the Noah music, you guys are very patient. And like it's not coming out until it's done. Yeah. We're definitely impatient through the process. But the end goal never seems... It never feels that way. Yeah, because we... Well, we're impatient and having heart attacks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wanting to finish it, but we also like really want it to be good. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't cut corners. That's been like interesting. God. Yeah, it's so tight. We like make more corners. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird. Uh, this is another uh, musician thing that I run into, and again, there's merits to both sides. But you have you have folks that are just content. Like, let me throw it out. Like, here's me right now. This is a representation of what I'm doing. Let me get it out there, and then the next thing will be a record of where I'm at then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But then there's also the super patient, like, I'm going to do this thing. It's going to be exactly what I want it to be. Like, do you feel like there's merits in both? I do. I mean, a lot of the time, if a lot of the stuff that I hear, that's just whatever, the first thing that's popped into someone's head and they put it out, usually, like, most of it doesn't move me at all emotionally sure. but I also just think it's kind of a reflection of our culture today that's like what it is mm. um, just like the speed of the internet I've, pe- people forget what happened last week or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. yesterday even um, mm-hmm. so that's just natural mm-hmm. and there's sides of me and, and also with Lewis like we'll both have our projects that we do things more quickly mm. on kind of um allow like at at least for me like with my solo stuff like I do um work really hard to get things right but I'm also not as perfectionist about things yeah yeah he seems extremely picky he is Mm -hmm. which I love and that makes him him yeah Mm -hmm. I could never do that Mm -hmm. yes but then he has he has his outlet for like the spontaneous thing like he'll do a gig and just write freaking five songs for that gig Mm -hmm. and they're like the coolest songs ever Someone, uh, who, I can't remember who was telling me about it, but someone brought up Clowncore the other day. And I, I think, right? I don't know if he was involved in that. I've Maybe. never heard of it. Okay, we can edit that out. I'll edit that part out. I didn't know it was here. Um, yeah, that's great that he has his, like, other outlet stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's crazy, because, like, I feel like that... That's such a, like, thing that represents you guys, like, how perfectly thought out it is and beautiful and, like, it's just, like, sounds fucking tight. And, like, but at the same time, I feel like there is room for both. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel like there's, in music, there's no real rules, you know? And it's almost, like, really fun to, um, to, like, break that. Like, break the rules, like, if they don't suit you or something Mm -hmm. or if they don't, like, really, like, 
sing or like ring true to your philosophy? Yeah, and? sure. There's yeah, there's this weird. I'm not a huge content guy. Like I, I really enjoy being a side man. Um, I think I've gone through parts of my life where I've wanted to be like heavy rider, but for the most part, I just haven't been yet. Um, the the one thing that I or the few things that I've put it put out. I've noticed that when I enter into like the, this needs to be super produced and perfect mindset, it gets so, it's like that perfect changes so much for me. Like if I take three months to work on it, whatever that perfect is, mm -hmm. is like different. It's, um, it's like the thing three months ago, you know, that was the three months ago thing. And then yeah. now like, oh, I've heard this done at totally. other shows or something like that. Yeah. Like, cause you run into that with your playing too. Yeah. You know, um, New York for me, and it hasn't happened as much here because I think I've just gotten older and like became more whatever the hell I'm supposed to be. But, um, you know, in New York, I was still coming up as a musician and I ran into a lot of like, what type of keyboard player should I be? So I'd work on something and I'd get there. And then by the time I'd have it, maybe I'm crazy, but I would feel like, damn, that's already... Like, I've heard that so much now mm -hmm. that I don't want to be it. Like, do you guys run into that oh when God, you're writing or arranging? Yes. Yeah? Like, I feel like that's part of the reason why I just put, sh so mu like, just put shit out there. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I hear it six, six months later and I'm kind of, like, over it. And so if, like, if I sit on an album for too long, I'll just, like, probably never release it. Because then it's like, okay, this is just old and, like, I don't like it anymore kind of thing. Yeah. But if I put it out, it's just like, okay, like, chapter closed, like on to next thing, you know, and it's like a different approach or something. And it's know. weird because there's business uh, ramifications to that. Maybe yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. What do you mean? Well, you, like the, you mean like, cause pro, like PR people need time it's, and it's, labels. It's, oh. that, <laughs> it's that and the, the perfectionist model, you know, like, yeah, I mean, if I think about mm -hmm. my favorite records ever, all of them took so damn long. I mean, I think about like Voodoo by D'Angelo. I think that was like a nine year record, <laughs> you know? That's and I think, I think Kid A took like a year and a half, two mm -hmm. years to make. And like Pet Sounds took for damn ever. Mm -hmm. So like those, you know, those people were kind of took, and maybe the model was different then because even Voodoo was shit 12 years ago or something like that. Um, probably like, I can't remember, but I mean, even then the, the internet model wasn't as strong. So I, yeah. Yeah, I almost true. wonder if the business model now is contributing to like why old folks like me are, are thinking that music is dying a little bit. Yeah, probably. Well, there's, there's not a ton of like, oh, this thing took me forever to make. There just isn't. Yeah, well, I do. I, I think that like producers probably are putting hours and hours and hours, but just compressed. Like they're probably just working like around the clock yeah mm -hmm. making shit perfect sounding and huge sounding and i think that's an amazing art form yeah but as far as like melodies and harmony go like at least with pop stuff that I, it really feels like not a lot of time is spent on that and i and i think if i grew up listening to the beach boys that would be kind of like oh, what the hell is this <laughs> shit coming out right now <laughs> yeah but i mean you, you I feel like that that model, even if we don't want it to work because we're impatient as people, like when I hear you and Luce's tunes, that shit is in my head for weeks. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Like, you, it's like the you, you, you don't you don't no. It's it's <laughs> great. It's a great problem. But That's you, you awesome. know the the hard work that you guys put into it, and this sounds corny, but it really it just has an impact. It's like oh, you guys obviously heard it a billion times because you probably sang it over a loop a billion times, Definitely. and that. It's like that energy goes into it, comes back out. Mm -hmm. And now I'm meeting like little kids in France who are like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> you know, like saying words that they don't know. You know, you hear little, little French kids saying butts and tits and money. And you, <laughs> yeah. you want to explain it, but you kind of don't. You, you know? uh -huh. um, yeah, it's, it's just crazy um, how, how intense that is. Um, give me, I, this is a question I was going to ask you guys earlier, but I'm, I'm obsessed with... I, I always do this practice weird thing where I, I try and like work on untraditional ways of getting better at my art. Mm -hmm. I know this is the broadest question of all time, so if you can't think of anything, just give me the old snaparoo and we'll move on. But what's did did either of you guys go to music school? Yeah, mm -hmm. you both did. Yeah. Where'd you Where'd you go? I went to first. I did community college at Santa Monica, and then I went to Cal State Northridge. Nice. And then I and then I went to Cal State Long Beach. 
Okay, and where where were you at? I went to I went to McGill University in in, in Montreal. Okay, dope. Yeah. And you guys both had was it like performance degree vibes? Yeah, jazz studies vocal. Jazz studies vocal. Jazz right? studies piano. Holy shit! <laughs> That's amazing. It's so what? Funny. Give me give me something that you. Because I, I have pretty intense opinions about college music yes. programs. As so I'm, do we. <laughs> as I'm sure both of you guys do. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like, maybe this is a deep topic, but uh, I feel like they promote a lot of things that aren't helpful anymore. Hmm. Um, but what, you know, what did you guys run into as far as untraditional things that you worked on, if any? When in school? Or I mean, or now it can be now too. Well, I, I was lucky to have been in a band right before I started college or where I, when I started college that was like electronic weird stuff and we were like influenced by Portishead and yeah. and like Massive Attack and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then when I went to school, like I came in, I think with a healthy mentality of knowing like I'm just wanting to learn stuff. Like I'm just learning what to call things and if, just kind of taking in what I could sure. and and so like I could kind of just look at it all as a take I'm just gonna take what I need yeah, but I yeah. think if I was going in there with a different mentality of like school's gonna give me my identity and school's sure. gonna teach me you know everything I'm, then I think that I would maybe be fucked yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but totally as far as like like weird weird well <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I think that's already strange, which is good, you know. Um, but I, f I feel like, and maybe it's just the way that you personally grasped it, but even in a place like Nebraska, shout out to Nebraska. <laughs> shout out to us Omaha slash Lincolners. Um, so awesome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, even there, you, you had, and I think this... I don't know if this started somewhere, if it was an LA thing or a New York thing, but you had the like jazzers who would latch on to, there was like the common groups. It was like the Radiohead and the Porter's Head and the Bjork, you know, like mm -hmm. I was shedding a lot of Bjork tunes. Yeah, that's cool. And it was always the weird thing, but then I moved to New York and I was like, damn, everybody did this. Oh wait, Glasper put out a record. Oh wait, Meldau put out a record. You know, like everyone had done yeah. it. So I feel like even hearing your music, something went around that. Like, I could tell that you grasped onto that stuff, but I don't know, I feel like a part of you latched onto it differently. Because mm -hmm. your music now is, I mean, it's, crazy. it's definitely influenced by that, but like, I think it's heavier. Thank you. I agree. Yeah. I kind of am influenced by a lot of different things, and it used to feel more separate. Like, yeah. school, the school stuff, and or the jazz stuff, and then the other stuff. And then I... I don't know. I kind of just try to be influenced by everything, yeah. Um, but pull what I like from it, and that's not common. That like I, there will be a whole world of songs in a certain genre, and I might just like one of them, or mm -hmm. sure, um, or one aspect to like an entire genre or something. Mm -hmm. um, and movies, like weird movies and stuff. And Lewis Cole was like my mm -hmm. biggest kind of like turning point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's like the coolest. Yeah, side road. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's there's a, a I don't know if it's a lesson or a narrative, but the college jazz programs and and I I teach this, but I feel like I I'm, I separate it when I teach it. The college jazz programs kind of encourage people to say go down this road. Right. Totally. Which which for educational purposes is wonderful. Like I I'll be the first person to say if you're trying to learn gospel music, only listen to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to learn jazz, only listen to that. Yeah. But I put a period at the end of that sentence, and then I start it with, okay, and when you're done, yeah. go yeah. on. You know what and I think is the biggest, the biggest um, question that can fuel me forever is, um, that, can, that can take me as deep and in into the most unique places is just, how do I feel now, and how can I say it as, mm. as clearly and effectively as I can totally yeah. and that's always changing and there's so many aspects like if you just think about one thing and how you feel about one thing there are so many aspects and so much life experience behind it mm -hmm. and so many ways to say it 
So like, yeah, I think that will bring out some like crazy ideas. Well, yeah. Or like a unique path to making music sure. yeah. or something. Yeah, the, the life experience tapping is, is hard. Like it's, and it's a hard thing to teach too. Like I don't, I wouldn't even know where to start. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I had one young student one time <laughs> who, I think I just told him that he needed to go through a breakup. <laughs> I was like, you have all the tools, bro. Just like go get beat up, go start a fight. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's the only way you're gonna have. Like you yeah. have all the other, you know, all the chops, all the knowledge. But yeah, I can, I can think of a, a bunch of players in the young scene who I kind of feel that about. But, like. Once you get beat up, you're going to make the greatest record I've ever heard, but <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. you need to get beat up once. Totally, man. Yeah, yeah. Totally. What did you run into in school in terms of, like, getting into weird stuff? Like, were you were you doing things that the school wasn't telling you to do? Did you find that you were super focused until after school was done? Yeah, man. I don't know. I had a really hard time because I feel like I just didn't really fit the mold, you mm-hmm. know? And so it, it kind of, like, made my experience just really awkward because I felt like a lot of my teachers just didn't know what the fuck was going on with me like I started out singing at the folk like in the vocal program and then I had always played classical piano and I felt really like not I just felt like I couldn't really express myself with it so then I switched instruments and then that confused my professors because it was like oh like they had like a kind of a mentality of like there was like the singers and then the instrumentalists and that really like annoyed me because it was just kind of like it's just music like Mm. it's not like dependent on like your instrument it's just you know but unfortunately at my school anyway that there was that vibe and so then I don't I don't know I just I just started writing and I feel like that really like made me just understand that it was about something else that like school was just totally disconnected from like music really like it, it was just a whole different path and like once I started writing, it kind of like made me feel free again, which yeah. was which was nice. Um, where did you get into like writing? You were writing tunes and singing them in college, right? Well, no, I was I was I started writing <laughs> I started writing for a salsa band. I was like really into sure. it. <laughs> it's like I'm just gonna make some. So I was like writing like some salsa, which was random as fuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was cool because it was a big group. It was like a septet, so it kind of taught me about like writing for a bigger band and stuff and then and then I started writing for the poetry project which was like a chamber ensemble and then I started writing for choirs I don't know I just kind of like wanted to write for a bunch of instrumentations and I really liked large ensembles mm-hmm. and now it's like the opposite because now I'm just like doing solo shit but you do solo and two people <laughs> where did you were you a transcriber or either of you transcribers mm-hmm like I know, I know vocalists. Are, I, I guess your your transcribing is just learn hella tunes and sing them like. I had to do like I had to transcribe and provide solos too. Whoa! Really? Yeah. Amazing. Like like horn players and stuff. Yeah, like I did like a That's Sonny amazing. Rollins That's one. I did, I did a couple of those. I did. I did a Bill Evans one, and one of the teachers was like. Why are you transcribing a piano solo? How is this going to help you? You're trying to sing court. You're trying to do the little halfway. And you're yeah. like, ah, I can sing all this. Yeah, yeah, no, I got this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you that, probably would get it because you have a fucking crazy <laughs> range. But that, really that to me is some practice weird kind of shit. Yeah. Because I, I never hear about singers learning horn solos. I mean, unless you're trying to be Ella, which you're not. Mm-hmm. You know, that's I like, was obsessed with Ella at the time. She could mm-hmm. definitely. She mm-hmm. was a horn player. Mm-hmm. Like she was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard her. I mean, she has double the chops I do for not being a piano player. So it's mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah, it's and, crazy. And were you EC's transcribing? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I'm, sh- I'm sure in jazz piano school they were making you like. Yeah. Parker it up. Oh my god, dude! I I was so obsessed with Keith Jarrett when I was in school that I was like trying to transcribe that. And then I remember my 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 teacher was I would, I got into like Herbie at one point and mm. I was like I really want to transcribe this and he was like no you are not ready. Oh. <laughs> I was like oh okay. my god. Okay cool. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but it was like I I probably wasn't ready for it but yeah Keith Keith was kind of my vibe. I really liked I really, I really that's like. Weird. That's weird that yeah. he said you weren't ready for Herbie, but you were ready for Keith. Yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> so loud. I don't yeah, really know. Like, I feel like yeah. there's steps in terms. Of <laughs> but this is the thing, dude. It's the, that's the thing that I feel like there's all these rules. Like it's yeah. all about rules, and I just think music is like literally the opposite of rules, you know. Yeah. And unfortunately, it gets like 
taught in terms of rules because I guess we have to teach it a certain way. But sure. like, I just, how cool would it be if it was more just like, do whatever everything you want. is music, like life is music, mm -hmm. like just like interpret it however the fuck you want. And like, yeah. I don't know, I feel like we would just be so much more liberated as like, as composers or like as you know as people trying to like make original shit like yeah you know the approach would just be so much more like open well and there's a weird i feel like you, th there has to be a line somewhere between setting a rule book and giving advice you know because I, I mean you guys both know i teach a ton of skype piano lessons and i i think at some point would maybe like to be a professor mm. but the thing that keeps me away from it is i don't know where that line is because I, I don't want to come out and say, you have to do this, but, I, but I see, I'll see things and be like, why are you doing that? And I, I try and remember all of this. I try and remember this vibe of like, man, when I was young, I had a lady literally tell me that if I didn't learn classical music, I wouldn't have a career in music. Mm -hmm. you know, and now she's out of a job and I tour the world. So, <laughs> Michael Jordan moment. <laughs> um, not For that real I'm though, man. Not myself to Michael Jordan. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, but you know what I'm saying? Like, that was like the high school cut you. You know, and you were like, well, screw it off. I'm going to practice really hard and, like, go in now. But that's a thing. Like, you don't want to crush some kid's dreams, but you exactly. also want to find a way to be like, man, maybe this is... Um, and it's it's funny that you bring up, like, Herbie and Jarrett because that came up in a lesson of mine the other day mm -hmm. where someone... I run into a lot of kids who will try and transcribe Corey. Mm -hmm. But they try, they go right to that, and they can't play, like, a pentatonic scale or they can't play major sevens in every key. You know? Right. And so you have this weird like, well, okay, do I tell you not to do that? Or, you know, because my experience with it was I transcribed Miles, which is already deep as hell. Like that was the first dude I took apart in jazz wise. Mm -hmm. And then I went right from him into Wayne Shorter and it killed me because I had no fucking idea <laughs> what Wayne was talking about. I think I tried to transcribe like dance cadavers. <laughs> like I could barely play a blues and I'm, over here trying to learn damn altered leads and shit like that. You know, so I mean, what's your opinion about that? Like, is, is there a line? Like, how do you, how would you guys approach that? Damn. It's tough, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it just, like, people are going to naturally find their way, like. Yeah, totally. And it's also good to give guidance. You can do it without being a dick, which I'm sure you do. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I try. <laughs> You, you've hung around me enough to where my, my dick levels kind of depend on the uh, mood of the dick room. Dick levels. <laughs> but also, I don't think you're ever a dick. But also, if you, I think sometimes sometimes you might say things and it might not sink in yet. Like, it might not even be what they're ready totally, to hear. Totally. But then later on, it'll be like, oh. That's yeah. what they were talking about. Okay, yeah, major, major yeah. seven chords. Yeah, I got it. I, that is important. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that is a good way to kind of maybe say, like, hey, this might help you, but do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Like, do what you love. Like, if you really want to learn yeah. Corey's Lingus solo, like, go ahead and do it. Yeah. You might not understand it yet, but do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, dude. I think my, my issue is I've ran into so many people who know that solo and then can't do anything, can't do anything else. else. Yeah, right. It's like, you know, so. Yeah, it's a weird... It's a weird teaching world currently. Mm -hmm. um, even, you know, even in looking, um, I'm not going to lie, as you guys know, touring is a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I think, I think my body probably has five, ten years of the most left of it. It's, uh, it's a lot, and I don't sleep yeah. when I try really hard. But, you know, I was looking into, okay, what would I have to do if someday I wanted to be a college professor? And so I spoke to, you know, a bunch of different people. Shout out to my buddy Brandon Draper, who's down at the University of Kansas. But, you know, all these people had the same message of like, man, right now you're going to get into a school and all the things that you talk about, all the things your scene talks about. And I include, you know, like the advice I've gotten from the knowers and the Coriandries and the whoever's like all in one thing. All the knowledge that those bands give me totally contradicts everything that uh, that you have to teach in these schools. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have like you absolutely have to because it's such a business behind colleges. Like in order to get accreditation, you have to teach what person A tells you, and person A is usually someone that hasn't gigged in thirty years. Right. Mm -hmm. so but there's so much you can that like I when I went to school I so it was so useful for me to learn all to learn like sure. what things were. And how th how people did it. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't think you. I think all that extra stuff is just 
kind of people trying to do what they think it would be best to tell people to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Well, and, and you, you, I think you did it right, too. You were in a place that, that you could take advantage of what was around you. Yeah. Which is fabulous, you know, like, um, I, I wish I would have tried to go to music school in a big city. Because then you have that, you know, you have that thing. You have the music school, like, okay, majors, minors, circle of fist, blah, blah, blah. But you also have, like, oh, damn, there's that underground session next door mm -hmm. that, yeah. like, none yeah, of my totally. professors are going to. Everyone's really high. You know, like, yeah. it seems like there's like a vibe the there. Maybe you should go and figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, so you definitely have, like, the thing that you can tap into both worlds, which is dope. Yeah. Where was, um, I think Lewis was telling me, he, he went to USC? Yeah. And he was a he was a jazz guy. Oh my god! I met him his last year of school, and he he would be like, "I gotta do my assignment," and it would be he would just do the assignment all wrong, just because like he wanted <laughs> to do it his own way. That's so good. It was really awesome. Like one of the assignments was to write a fugue for three orchestral instruments, Whoa. and he wrote this crazy beautiful piece for three midi bassoons and, just, <laughs> and he sings on top of it about like not killing a fly it's the most awesome thing oh my god it's the best <laughs> so awesome. but now he goes back to his teachers would be like okay but now his teachers i think have kind of come around you know well i mean they're i'm sure they're seeing how his career is going yeah but that's the thing like that's I feel like that's bullshit because I feel like they should have just realized that from the from like that's if it takes like this career mm -hmm. quote unquote career thing to like make you realize that someone is actually super tight sure. then that's like not that cool you know mm -hmm. it's like you should just listen to the music and like listen to like the originality of people and like let that judge be mm -hmm. the I don't know yeah. I read yeah. this thing this this is maybe kind of random but I read this study that teachers were, um, ah, they were like talking, they, they had to rate students um, that they thought were creative Whoa. and that they thought were obedient and stuff like that. And t a lot of teachers tended to think that the students who were more obedient were, act they would say, oh, and they're very creative. When the more creative students were less obedient ones and mm. the teachers would grade them as not creative. Because they just, I think, didn't like that they the just kids didn't like were them. not obeying. They didn't want to <laughs> yeah. deal with the pain in the ass, Lewis Coles. Exactly. More the Genevieve or Tatties. I was good as long as I had my bagel. I wouldn't talk. <laughs> you weren't. You were on a fire starter in college. Why do I no. not believe that? I was good. We should have just gone to college together, and then it would have been. <laughs> oh, God. Well, watch out. <laughs> Maybe I'm happy now I didn't go to music school. That makes it sound, <laughs> that makes it sound way worse. Yeah, I man, didn't get accepted a, to music school. There you go. I auditioned and they were like, nah, you're too uh, ear-based. That's crazy. What? <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Well, That's funny, to, to be fair, it, this doesn't make it better, but it was the University of Nebraska. So it was, Holy it was shit. a bunch of classical heads being like, oh man, like that guy's B-flat fingering was wrong. Which it was, it was absolutely wrong. It's terrible, <laughs> you know. But but isn't school to show you, you how think, to you do know, it you right? Would, you would think if I'm paying you like ten grand a year, you're not gonna have an issue showing me the correct fingering for your dumb scale. Oh my yeah. God. Which even to this day, like, do you remember? Well, you, you know think where of, they can stick their fingering. <laughs> 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 when's when's the last time? <laughs> <laughs> when let the, that let that ring. No, that's good. Yeah. Let that let, ring we'll out. Add, we'll add some <laughs> reverb to that one. <laughs> so what, I was thinking about this the other day. When's the last time you played a damn scale in a song? I can't remember the last time I was like me 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 me. Oh, on the end song. of on the end of. Um, I'm trying to think. On um <laughs> on 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 feels true. I just did this. <laughs> <laughs> but I took that from the the Louis Armstrong recording of um, Love Young Rose because it's so pretty. Somebody does that. Mm. That's so good. So, um, but other than that, no scales. <laughs> no scales. <laughs> this is hilarious. But the last time I heard a scale in a song was during the Barack Obama election. Stevie Wonder was doing some like promoting for his like vote for Barack. And he was like, Barack Obama. No. Or <laughs> really? Or some shit like that. Holy shit. Yeah. So maybe Stevie was trying to like 
make people's college money worthwhile. <laughs> See, Stevie knows. Like, Stevie knows, like, damn. Those this. major scales. And he's like, no, nah, we got we to gotta bring this back. I should I should promote the presidency by singing <laughs> Oh, my God. I, have, I might have to find that video. That's or something. funny. See, that's for when I have money to have a producer for these podcasts. I'm going to be like, yo, Bill, <laughs> find me that Stevie Wonder video. I'm going like, to pop it on the screen. Bill, that's such, a, that's such a perfect name. Yeah, it's a Nebraska name. It's an oh, my God. Speaking of Nebraska... <laughs> I just found out today, I think maybe I knew this, but I found out I don't that think you knew it. I feel like we've talked about this at some point. I know. It feels familiar. Yeah. But ECs, <laughs> ECs learned English I did. in Omaha, Look Nebraska. Give me a cell, bitch. So we are both ex-Nebraskans. We are, man. That's amazing. It's crazy. It's Where, so random. What part of Omaha did you live in? I don't remember. I was seven. Just Omaha. <laughs> I just lived in, in a couple places. My, my mom went there to do something and she took me with her and yeah I remember just like she dropped me off the first day of school and like I had no I did not know any English yeah. and she was like okay like I gotta go to university and I was like <laughs> so fucking scared and like didn't understand anyone and like I remember I had to like draw a toilet at one point because I yeah, really yeah. needed to pee and like I couldn't <laughs> didn't know how to communicate that I needed to go to did the you bathroom. Put a, did you put a turd like, in it? I don't remember what I drew, but like it got me to the bathroom and then Maria showed me around and she was like my only friend there. And it was really fun. It was cool. I don't know. It was That's really so different. Cool. It was different. It was, yeah, it was really different than Colombia. You were, you, you definitely wouldn't have been taking in, you wouldn't have been taking advantage of the uh, budding indie rock scene of the time. No, fuck no. Because Omaha, Omaha had, <laughs> there was probably five years maybe where there was like a serious indie rock vibe in Omaha and you had bands like Bright Eyes, like Connor Oberst was out of there. Oh, shit. Sure. That's you had, cool. You had the other big bands of my time were, there was a band called Cursive that was like kind of, I don't know how to describe them, but like aggro proggy and with really interesting lyrics. And then you had this band called The Faint. Have you ever heard of The Faint? No. I have to play you. That sounds familiar. Tony, I have to play you The Faint. It was this electronic quartet. And the thing that I remember them, I mean, I, I got into them after they were already like kind of big, but they were the first band that Trent Reznor called to do like hit one of his remix records. And I remember thinking like, shit, this band's in Omaha using all this analog gear, like going the fuck in on synthesizers. Like, where do you even... I gotta check them out. Where do you even get a synthesizer in Omaha, Nebraska, <laughs> you know? But yeah, there was like a five... And luckily I was Wait, what of, were you doing at that time before you discovered... <laughs> I was playing indie rock. Guitar? No. I would, that's... Okay, so all the weird, verby, bendy shit that I do came from me wanting guitar gigs. Because oh, yeah. the only bands in Omaha were like indie rock gigs. So I was like, well, fuck, there's, no one's playing Rhodes. Right. You know, so I had to like learn how to, like, how do I take that guitar player's gig? That's so cool. That's tight. Wait, like, evil. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's, yeah, I mean, it's definitely like, it's a little dark, but um, yeah, it got me there. And I, I uh, you know, I, that ended up also being the reason that I moved to New York was because I was into bands like the White Rabbits, who they were just playing at the taco restaurant we were just at. Really? Yeah, they were playing the White Rabbits and bands like Grizzly Bear. Oh, yeah. And shit like that. And all these bands were coming out of New York. I move up there, get nothing but R&B gigs and such is life. And now here I am, which I'm happy about it. But <laughs> it didn't, you know, it started off as like, I was kind of a wannabe rocker. Um, and honestly, this is going to sound crazy, but like right now, like I've been playing with you guys, with Noah or more. And I've been doing a bunch of hits with Donnie McCaslin. And I think the reason that I am so fucking happy each time I'm on stage with you guys and Donnie's group, apart from like you guys just being beautiful people, is like you guys are kind of rock bands. Totally. Like there's some shreddy mm. ass moments. Definitely. Like, also, the energy, also the energy is yeah. like fucking like hard. It's a, like yeah, the power <laughs> stance. Like I am bringing the power stance out yeah, every are. show. I don't get to do the power stance in any other group. <laughs> But dude, that's the thing, that's the spirit, and that's honestly, that's the spirit of so much, so much music, like, just like, going for it, you yeah. know? It's like, unsafe music or something, you know? You have, you it's have like, to. All, all the jazzers, who I respect the most, exactly. do that. Exactly. Like, exactly. I think, uh, do you guys know this cat, Eric Lewis, out of New York? Mm -hmm. E. Lou, he goes by? I think his mm -hmm. name's Eric Lewis. I've, I've only seen him a couple times, but I've heard him in videos, and like, he's this big dude, huge hair, 
and he would like walk into smalls and he would just like he would look like damn this guy has gone through some shit today and it wasn't like not as a negative like oh you look like shit or something but he would he just okay. he just had this really intense energy and he would sit down the piano and just melt your face off and it was smart like he would start like very chill but by the end of it you're like damn like this is a it's like a it's like a who solo or like a you know Pink Floyd moment or some shit like that, and like you know Meldow obviously goes there with some of his shit. Keith Jarrett definitely go- he wouldn't admit it, I don't think, but he definitely goes there with his stuff. Oh yeah. And like I I feel like that's that's such a good, the the go for it thing is so right, you know like. Yeah, or and it's also like the no fear thing, you know like yeah. fear's been coming up up a lot for me. Just like we were talking mm. about it the other day, Jen. But like, yeah, just like trying to approach your life without that, without that like essence of fear guiding your decisions. And that, and that really, that really sings true. And like when you improvise, I feel like, sure. because so many times like you're about to do something or you're about to play something. And then you're like, wait, like what chord is this? Or like what, what's happening harmonically? And it's like, ah. that's all bullshit. Like it's like, just play what you feel and like, let that that's guide huge. it, you know? That's huge. How do you, if I'm trying to teach that to an 18 year old up and comer, what do I say? <laughs> help me help me make some money here. <laughs> I don't know if I can make you help me make some money. <laughs> that's so real though. I mean that that's such a that's such a uh, an approach that again it's one of those messages that I feel like people hear like, oh be fearless, dance as if no one is watching, like that whole yeah. shit. Yeah. But in music like those are the people that make it. I mean, those are the people who are touring in the scene I'm in, at least. I mean, not like it's some grandiose world or whatever, but like all the people who I respect are like, fuck it, I'm going to do this thing and I don't care what you think. Totally, man. You know, like, I've shit, I've seen Lenny Reese, the drummer I play with at the, in, in the lesson, that dude punches his toms. Like, he takes a drum solo and he'll come out and his knuckles will be falling off. And you're just, you know, <laughs> at first you're like, Damn, you're already all right. You make sure he's all right, but like you realize, like he's literally just like, ah, like his drum solo is ah, it's just this yeah. big thing, you know. Yeah. And like I, I get that with you and Lewis too. Like yes. your guys' shit is so Absolutely. intense. Like I can just tell, like you're not thinking about any, you're not thinking about the crowd, you're not thinking about yeah. like being, being, you know worried about what's coming out. It's like not nah, emotion. Like this is my time. Go. Yeah. That's true. And that's and that's not to say that you don't need like to have your shit together beforehand. Of course. But like whatever that means to you. But yeah, it's like in the moment. It's like life, you know? Yeah, yeah. In the moment, just fucking make a decision, that's you know? The, if you the more you worry about it, the more shit you're gonna miss. Exactly. Yeah. You guys, we just did an hour. Thank you for <laughs> Thank you for being part of the hang and uh, for you. dealing with my jank mic setup for this first podcast. What? No um, way. It's beautiful. It's it's big and blue. It looks a little naughty. I'm not going to lie. It's totally <laughs> So, yeah, me, me taking this around, I'm just, you have to tell people, like, nah, it's a microphone. We're good. It's a microphone. Trust That's me. It's a big, a big, uh, yeah. big boy. So come, I'm going to tell everyone to come see you guys in L.A. on the 5th, correct? Yes. At where again? Bootleg. The fifth at the bootleg, Isis and Genevieve will be performing. I think in that's the middle of your tour, so you guys will be in. It's the, well, yeah, kind of. It's like the closer for me. Yeah, for our little run. Okay, so it's the U.S. closer. It's the US. And we're opening for this band, Bernice. Yes. Check them amazing. out. Amazing. I checked them out yesterday. They're, They're really crazy. beautiful music. Too. Yeah, I love Robin's them. Robin's a genius. Woman. Are they all L.A.? No, Toronto. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those guys were really... That was my bedtime vibes last night. Mm-hmm. It put me in a place, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't, do you really want it to... Nah. <laughs> nah. Nope, I was alone last night. So. <laughs> For more on that song, the next podcast where we dive deep into the uh, Monifa... 90s. 90s. 90s the 90s sex music vibes. <laughs> yeah. We can cover it with our band, Divorcian. Oh my god, that would be the greatest day of my life. Dr. Divorcian. Dr. Divorcian. <laughs> I feel like if we keep going, this is going to be another 40 minutes of yeah. weird inside jokes and awkwardness, which these people would probably love. But anyway, buy both Isis and Genevieve's records. 
they're all beautiful music and they're beautiful people. You guys, thank you so much for being a part of one of my first things. Thank you. And I love both of you and I uh, hope to see you guys both soon. I love you. Bye. See you guys. Yeah. That's awesome.